Hello, everyone, and welcome to our final talk for today. We're going to now hear about the Geology Museum itself, a scientific and architectural history of the Geology Museum. It'll be presented by Dr. Carly Yanni and Carol McCarty. Dr. Yanni is a distinguished professor of architectural history in the art history department at Rutgers. She's the author of three monographs, the most recent, Living on Campus, an Architectural History of the American Dormitory, was published by the University of Minnesota Press in 2019. In 2019, she was honored with the Faculty Scholar Teacher Award from Rutgers, a university-wide recognition for professors who creatively introduced their scholarship into the undergraduate classroom. She is currently the second vice president of the Society of Architectural Historians. Carol McCarty received her master's degree in art history with a concentration in cultural heritage and preservation studies from Rutgers in 2019. She is currently the community history program coordinator at the New Jersey Council for the Humanities. She's also conducting archival research on the history of the Rutgers Geology Museum collections. So Carla and Carol, welcome. And I'm going to stop sharing and turn this over to you. Thank you very much. It's good to see you, Kathy. It's been a while. Yes. Um, so I'll just share my screen and get started. Um, and I'm going to assume that if anything goes awry, somebody will let me know. There we go. Okay. That looks good. So uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, I've been at Rutgers quite some time, so I've learned a lot about the history of the place. Um, and I'm gonna start with the architectural history of uh, the Geology Museum, but I wanna begin with Rutgers College in the 1840s. This may be a familiar image to many of you. Uh, Old Queens is in the center here on top of a hill. The hill had been covered with an orchard uh, before Old Queens was built. Uh, the city of New Brunswick would be over to the left. Um, this is the president's house, this little box-like building that was demolished in the 1940s. And you can see Van Nest Hall over here in this drawing. So this is what the area looked like before the Geology Museum was built. Um, the Geology Museum at Rutgers wasn't the first science museum on a college campus. Um, we're confident that it's the first geology museum, so you have, it has to be exclusive to geology. There were other natural history museums on college campuses. Probably the best known in the English-speaking world was the one at Oxford, which was designed by the architects Dean and Woodward, uh, begun in 1855 and opened in 1860. And this this building was, uh, it contained classrooms and it was kind of like a science center for the university at Oxford. It had a very unusual interior uh, uh, with exposed ironwork. And it also had this interesting characteristic uh, that we can find in some other science museums, which is that the objects of nature are built into the fabric of the building. So these are different types of British and Irish marbles, and they are made into the columns for the upper amb ambulatory space of the museum. And then they're labeled on the, on the base so that it's a, it's a geological display, but it's also built into the fabric of the building. Here in the United States, uh, the Wagner Free Institute of Science was started in 1855, but that wasn't connected to a university. That was a freestanding public science museum, but it's certainly something that would have been familiar to people at Rutgers when they were considering building the geology museum. The Museum of Comparative Zoology at Harvard would, was also very well known um, both in, in the UK and across the United States for its outstanding collections and for the leading scientists who worked there. Uh, things really changed uh, for the teaching of science in American universities with the passage of the Land Grant Act of 1862, 
also called the Morrill Act, Morrill Act. Um, this was the largest incursion from the federal government into education in the history of the United States at that time. The federal government was much smaller in 1862 anyway, but certainly stayed out of things like education. But the idea was that the colleges that already existed were too small, too elite, and they taught impractical things like classics and church history and uh, Euclidean geometry. The Morrill Act was to try to make higher education more practical, to teach the next generation of farmers to be more scientific and more efficient, to teach the next generation of engineers. So the phrase A&M, Texas A&M, that comes from agriculture and mechanics. Um, mechanics is what we would call engineering. Um, also included in the Morrill Act was uh, military training, military science. The idea was to make higher education more relevant to what were considered to be kind of ordinary real world concerns of the 1860s. Um, we should remember that um, it's called the Land Grant Act, and the federal government, the, the sort of presumption or in the way it traditionally has been presented, if you pick up a textbook from 20 years ago, is that these were grants of land from the federal government to colleges. But where did the federal government get that land? They stole it from Native Americans. They either seized it outright, used violence, or through shady treaties. Uh, here at Rutgers, the, like many other universities like the Oxford Museum, which I just showed, showed you, there were professors who had collections and the collections were kind of scattered around the campus. They might be, they might be in somebody's home, they might be in somebody's classroom, but they weren't pulled together and they weren't in a single building, which made it hard for students to use them. So gathering everything together under one roof was, was a significant step forward. And although the money from the Land Grant Act could not be used specifically to build buildings, the monies, could, the monies from the Land Grant Act would free up other funds that then could be used to construct buildings. And um, the Geology Museum is very much part of that first blush of expansion after the land grant, after Rutgers got the land grant, largely through the efforts of George Cook, and uh, shows Rutgers turning itself toward agriculture science, science in general, agricultural science in, in particular. Um, we're going to learn a little bit more about this fellow here from our next speaker, Carol. Um, but for now, I just want to say that the uh, museum was built in, from 1870 to 1872. The Mastodon was acquired then, but it wasn't installed until much later. In terms of the architecture, the Geology Museum was built at the same time and by the same architect as the chapel. The architect was Henry Hardenberg, whose uh, uh, great, great, great grandfather was one of the, was the first president of Rutgers. And you can see that the Geology Museum and the chapel, they're, they're not identical, they're not twins, but they're siblings. They had share a familial relationship. They're the same kind of stone. They're approximately the same size. They come forward, they pop forward from the facade of Old Queens, the same distance. So they form kind of bookends on either side of Old Queens. This is a, a Gothic style, pointed arches. This is more of a Renaissance style. Um, and, and so they're, they're related to one another and they form a, a three building ensemble on the crest of that hill. From the other direction, this would be, this is from George and Hamilton looking back at the other side of Old Queens. So that's the president's house, which there's a parking lot there now. Uh, this is the chapel, but from the other side, Old Queens is here and the geology museum is here. So we're just looking at it from the other side. Um, that arrangement of a long bar-shaped building with two rectangular buildings on either side, perpendicular to the, to the central building. You could also have found that if you turned around and 
looked at the other end of College Avenue. I mean, I'm sorry, of the other end of Voorhees, what we call Voorhees Mall. At the time, it was a bleaker place. And you would have seen Herzog Hall, which was the center building of the seminary, and two buildings on either side, uh, Sage Library here and Saddam Hall there. George H. Cook lived in this house here. So that means that on either end of Bleecker Place, what we call Voorhees Mall, there were these collections of three buildings and they were very much in communication with one another. This is the Geology Museum on the left and the Sage Library on the right. Um, Detlef Lienau was the architect of Sage Library. He was one of Hardenberg's teachers. So although this building is a few years later, uh, he may have gotten the job through his pupil. How did 19th century students use objects? How did they learn science? Um, we think of science today as experimental science, right? You take biology and there's a lab attached to it. You take chemistry, there's a lab attached to it. That wasn't so much the case in the 19th century. Uh, the primary way that students learned from nature was by looking, by training the eye. It was the visual scrutiny of objects is the, is, is the way that scientists studied the natural world. And um, uh, that means that you needed lots of natural light. You needed op open spaces where you could look at objects. Um, it was helpful to have as many things on display as possible. That's why I think to our eyes, sometimes 19th century museums look a little bit crowded. Uh, and so the Rutgers Geology Museum very much uh, fits into that idea of how people learn. There's one scholar, Stephen Kahn, who calls this an object-based epistemology. So it's a way of knowing the world that's based on looking at objects and it governs almost all museum design in the 19th century, science and art as well. There's a close-up of the geology museum. Um, you can see the whale skeleton, you can see the, the original um, cases or vitrines. And it, so a museum like this needed to have big windows for, for lots of natural light. And we also have this balcony, or another level of display area around the outside of the main room. There were classrooms and other things on the first floor. The second floor was a double height museum space, which very much is still there in very good condition today. Um, we are lucky, very lucky at Rutgers that we not only have a science museum from the 1870s uh, and the first geology museum, in the US, exclusively devoted to geology, uh, a museum that is directly related to the land grant in the sense that one of the main points of the land grant was for people to study agriculture. And geology is not, is the study of rocks, yes, but it's also the study of soil. And it is also the study of, the, of minerals that can be used as fertilizer. So the study of geology is, directly related to the study of agriculture. And this museum is a monument to that. But we have the original building. Um, the interior has not been changed that much. And we have a very good sense of what the collections look like. We still have the mastodon. We still have a lot of the original collection. So we're, we have a historic building that's being used for its original purpose. And that's extraordinarily rare. And uh, that's one of the things that those of us involved in the Geology Museum are always eager to share with an audience and celebrate. So um, I think I'm gonna stop there and let, and let Carol um, continue. And I'll stop my share and you'll start yours, right? Okay, and if any, and I, I know there are questions at the end. So if you have questions, I'll, I'll be here at the end. Okay, let me share my screen.
There we go. Uh, hold on just one moment. Okay, there we go. Okay, so thank you everyone so much for having me here today. And thank you, Dr. Yanni. I'm so excited to be a part of this event because the Rutgers Geology Museum has been an interest of mine for several years now. Um, the museum was actually the subject of my master's thesis. And for the last couple of years, I've been continuing that research, now focusing on the history of the collections here at the museum. And this past fall, I had the opportunity to examine William S. Butt Valiant's papers at Special Collections and University Archives here at Rutgers. And for me, his papers were a treasure trove. So that's why I'm really excited to tell you about him today. So let's get started. Um, William Valiant, he was born in 1845 in Rome, New York. He was a pivotal figure in the history of the Rutgers Geology Museum because he was the first person to actually organize the collections into a functioning museum. Um, you know, the architecture, like Dr. Yanni was talking about, that provided the space for gathering. The collections of the museum provided the tools for instruction. And while the architecture and the collections were critical, there were also key people at Rutgers who utilized that architecture and organized the collections so they could be used to convey the scientific knowledge that was happening at that time. And William Valiant was the first person who did that here at Rutgers. So Valiant's mother was his first teacher. She was a botanist and really gave Valiant his first lessons in both books and, natural, and the natural history of their home region in Rome, New York. Um, so that by the time he was eight years old, Valiant basically took to the fields in the woods and began what he called a lifelong search for stone trophies. So a big event in Valiant's life happened in 1862 at 16 years old he lost his left arm in an accident at the mill where he worked. And this is a newspaper article that was published just after the accident that describes the events in rather gruesome detail, particularly the amazing fact that for that time period, not only did Valiant have a complicated surgery to amputate his arm, but he survived that surgery. And that was a big deal for the time and that's why it made it into the newspaper. So um, following the accident, uh, Valiant says that even though he was quite weak, he was up and about in about three weeks. And um, then at that point attended his first and only term of school in 1862. But then after that one term, he decided to go back to the mill for 15 more years to work there. So while working at the mill, he continued to search for geological treasures in his days off. Um, and he decided at one point that he felt he needed um, a guide or a book in order to do this, do this searching a little bit better. So he found Dana's manual of mineralogy and geology and struck up a correspondence with James Dana, which then led to an introduction and communications with New, Jer New, York, New York State geologist, James Hall. So at this point, he was really establishing relationships with people within the discipline. So that by seven, 1875, Valiant began classifying and cataloging private collections in the Rome, New York area. Um, still kept on searching for you know, stone trophies in his free time. And in 1884, he by chance found a fossil of a trilobite with its leg intact near his home in Rome. This was a big deal because usually the appendages deteriorate, deteriorated before they were actually fossilized. And up until this point, scientists suspected that this particular arthropod had appendages, but no one had found the fossils to prove it. So uh, when he found this partial fossil, he decided he had to find an intact specimen and searched for that intact specimen for eight more years. So that finally in 1892, he found an intact specimen of the trilobite that would come, that he would come, it would come to be known as Triarthus becchi. Um, the specimens that he found were preserved in pyrite in a bed of shale with all antenna, all appendages intact. And that really made Valiant one of the first to prove that this trilobite actually had appendages. 
So at that point, Valiant decides to write to several regional paleontologists and sends them samples of these, um, these trilobites. One of the samples ended up going to a young professor at Yale by the name of Charles Beecher. Beecher immediately took a lease on the land where Valiant told him that he found the samples. And Beecher excavated that land from 1893 to 1895. Um, with very successful results. Um, this image on the left that you're looking at is one of the samples that Beecher found in that bed. And um, the image on the right is a sample that Valiant actually sent to Beecher around the same time. Um, and they, these, both, these samples are both at the Yale Peabody Museum today. So this photo was taken on September 26, 1892. And it shows William Valiant over here with the V and his brothers, his half brother, Sid Mitchell, Sid Mitchell here with the M. Um, and the notations on the photo here were made by Valiant himself. And this X right over here on the right side of the picture um, shows where the trilobite specimens with appendages were found in place. So that is marking the exact location of the trilobite bed that would come to be known as Beecher's bed. Um, just a few months after this photo was taken, Professor Albert Huntington Chester asked Valiant to take charge of the collection in the museum at Rutgers College at the time and Valiant accepts the job and arrives at Rutgers with his wife on April 6th, 1893. So in his descriptions of the beginning of his time at Rutgers, it's clear that Valiant is rather shocked at the state of the Rutgers Geology Museum when he arrives. He states that the original condition of the museum was quote unquote, beyond description. And that the Rutgers Geology Museum was really kind of a geological conglomerate of things and in a completely haphazard state. He says the collections were here, there and everywhere. And it, he describes it something, as something like a moving day after a fire. So in general, it's his job to clean all this up. His biggest task is to clear up, classify and label everything pertaining to geology in the museum at a salary of $40 per month, half of which was paid by Professor Chester. So there was initially a short period of organization because at, when he got there, there were no classified collections of any kind that could be used for illustrations to support lectures in the classroom. So his first task was to make separate systematic arrangements for rocks and fossils and minerals and comb through what he found at the geology museum um, to get these things, get these classifications in place for the, the fall 1893 term so that they could be, be finally used for lectures in the classroom. Um, and he also did one other thing when he first got there. He changed all the locks in the museum because when he arrived, you needed about a hundred keys, a hundred different keys to open the museum, the classroom doors, all the collections cases, and Valiant thought that that was ridiculous. So he reduced that to a more manageable 10 keys. So Valiant tells us in his papers that basically this, this original and early organization and classification took about six years until the entire mass was reduced to something like a respectable museum. One of his official duties was to keep the museum open and free for anyone who wanted to come to welcome visitors and to explain the collections to them. So while he was supposed to be organizing the museum, that work had to stop when visitors arrived. And another thing that affected his work as well was weather because the, since the building had no heat, there were times, especially in the winter and the summer when it was either too cold or too hot to be able to work in the museum. So the museum opened April 15th, 1893. And the first visitor that William Valiant entertained at the museum was Mrs. George Cook and her daughter. And at, by the end of that year in um, 1893, there were 259 visitors that came to the museum. And 
also, in addition to working directly with the collections at this point, William Valiant also delves into the origin of the collections and the museum by learning about the activities of the Natural History Society at Rutgers College. In his papers, he provides historic details of, this, of the Natural History Society. He includes meetings, lists of members, collections, reports, so that in time, Valiant not only knows every inch of this museum and what it contained, but he understood the history and the provenance of the collections as well. So by 1899 and 1900, Valiant write, decides to write a detailed description of the museum and collections and has photos taken of the interior and distributes this as a pamphlet. And he actually had to pay for the printing and the postage to distribute this pamphlet himself. Now, considering how he described the state of the museum when he arrived, when I look at this photo of this, these gleaming orderly collections, I imagine that this must have been a great moment of pride for Valiant. This and, and the pamphlet was a perfect way to advertise the facilities and the work that he did. At this point, he estimates the museum collections had about 20,000 specimens with an average of 3,000 visitors per year to this free and public museum. And also around this time, Valiant notes that after public school hours, um, he says, quote, many boys and girls come in, some from curiosity, others to play, but most of them to learn something. Some of them make a mess of the register, but we can't refuse them, end quote. So I thought that that was a cool little detail that he included in sort of his day-to-day -day, uh, responsibilities. Around the same time in 1901, Valiant was considered for the position of New Jersey State Geologist, but ultimately was not chosen. Um, in a letter to a friend, Valiant seemed quite weary of the details of this whole situation, but clearly believed he had been passed over for political reasons and for a lack of education. He, again, only, only attended that one term of school back when he was 16, um, but specifically the political reasons because he didn't campaign for himself. And he proudly stated in the letter that he absolutely refused to do that. By this point, Valiant had also started regularly contributing articles on the Rutgers Geology Museum and its collection to a periodical for the discipline called Mineral Collector. Here you can see that the editor of Mineral Collector decided to honor Valiant's work by publishing his a full page photo and um, in the December 1898 issue with a note about some of the work that Valiant had done, but he did this without Valiant's knowledge. And in the note, you can see right over here at the bottom, the editor writes a little note basically saying that Valiant may be upset with him for doing this, but the editor basically says it'll be okay because Valiant only has one arm and I have a record as a runner. So this really speaks to the relationships and the friends that Valiant has made within the, within the discipline. So at this point, Valiant finished his initial organization of the museum, but given that there were always additions to the collection by gift, exchange, purchase, the work would never be done. Um, for example, he revises historic collections um, after 1900. So he revised the Beck and Cook and Chester collections. And um, then a few years later in 1906, heat was installed in the museum and Valiant was absolutely thrilled to report that in the winter of 1906-07, the museum was kept warm for the first time. And that same year, a desk laboratory with gas connections was installed. And Valiant declared that with this addition, that the museum was equipped with everything needed to make it one of the best mineralogical laboratories in the area. So now we're up to 1909 um, and Valiant at this point writes a 24 page handwritten report to um, Rutgers President Demarest uh, that provides a detailed history of the museum and all it contains. He states in the um, report that he was brought to Rutgers because he, knew because he knew how, not to learn how, and that this report that he's giving to Demarest represents a lifetime of his work. 48 years in preparation and 16 years in being at the um, college at that point. 
Um, in the report, he estimates that the collections now have 30,000 specimens in it and that he has written at least 50,000 labels over the years. In this report, Valiant also directly questions the fact that after 16 years, he's still the assistant to the curator. Um, he says, and I'm going to read this out loud, um, 16 years of hard work and study, we have not been able to graduate or obtain a diploma or a degree. The name assistant is good as far as it goes. But who has written a larger thesis? Are not the labels, records, and abundant evidence of scientific work in the museum much more than a thesis? The usual thesis is prepared after nearly four years of college work is done and may take a few weeks to prepare. How will that compare with 40 years in the field and 16 years in a public museum and the association with professors, students, scientific specialists from everywhere and all kinds of visitors for 16 years and assistants still? Now, I know these are a lot of words to put on a slide, but I felt that it was important for all of you to see Valiant's words and to feel his frustration. I'm not sure if these exact words were ever submitted to President Demarest because in Valiant's papers, there's two slightly different versions of this report and it's unclear if both or either were given to Demarest. But in 1909, it's clear that after 16 years as assistant to the curator, Valiant is frustrated with his position. So in this report that he writes to Demarest, Valiant also references a thousand handwritten page manuscript that he's written. And here's a picture of the manuscript in all its glory in, Rutgers, in special collections and university archives at Rutgers. He also writes a three page index to the manuscript. Um, the manuscript provides a complete history and description of the Rutgers Geology Museum building, classrooms, collections up to that point, as well as general geological information for New Jersey and New Brunswick. And the index also lists fun things like baby mastodon, stuffed owl, slimy reptiles, and other just interesting tidbits. Um, in the manuscript, Valiant also devotes two chapters to relics, one on relics that have been, had been found in the New Brunswick area already, and another called relics to be sought for by future collectors. And that's the one on the right over here. Valiant actually gives detailed instructions on places to look within New Brunswick to, in the year 2020 to find relics. So I don't know, I think this would be, would be a really cool um, field trip idea for the Rutgers Geology Museum. So the last chapter in the thousand page manuscript is called, What is an Education? And in this chapter, Valiant devotes 25 pages to his rather bitter musings on the meaning of formal education. Here we have another window into Valiant's personal opinions. And while you could say that lack of education is a great regret of his, I think that it's equally accurate to say that he vehemently believed a formal education was not the only path. He believed that passing over individuals like himself for lack of formal education and sometimes for lack of an arm um, was vastly unjust because it made it seem like just because someone wasn't a graduate, it necessarily meant that they had no education. And he believed that a formal education proved absolutely nothing of practical value and that if a man was made of the right stuff, he would succeed in or out of school. Um, by 1913, Valiant had finally been promoted from assistant to the curator to curator. But by 1918, he was ready to retire and he, did, he and his wife wanted to go back to what they felt was their only true home in Rome, New York. President Demarest asked him to wait until a conversation could, could be had with then director of the museum, Professor J. Volney Lewis, who was out of town at the time. So we sort of put him off for a little while. So by now we've reached the year 1920 in Valiant's story. And I'd like to circle back for a moment to the specimens of trilobites that Valiant sent to Professor Beecher at Yale back in 1892. As I mentioned, Beech, Beecher took a lease on the land, excavated the land, 
found numerous intact specimens and he continued that research until his death. He suddenly died in 1904, at which point Beecher's student, Percy Raymond, takes over and continues the research and ultimately publishes a combination of Beecher's research and his own in 1920. Valiant, and so here in the, um, the highlighted section over here, you can see that Raymond credits Valiant with being the first to discover what would become known as the, as the famous Beecher's bed and a critical source for intact specimens of trilobites at that time. And I recently learned from a collections manager at the Yale Peabody Museum that Valiant's role in this discovery and the subsequent research is quite well known and accepted. Um, Valiant did retire briefly around this time, but he returned to New Brunswick and continued to be active in the museum until 1923 when he was no longer strong. He was, wasn't strong enough to attend to his duties anymore. So in the end, although he was frustrated and perhaps disappointed with some aspects of his life, colleagues and professors who came to the museum in the years after Valiant would say that his was a life of usefulness. William Valiant's papers are incredibly rich with detail and information, as you now know. Um, this archive of Valiant's professional life and work at the Rutgers Geology Museum is an incredible resource for those of us who study the museum and its place within the history of Rutgers University. His, his papers provide us with an incredibly detailed history of the museum, its collections, the people who manage them and use them, and really maps out a clear picture of not only Valiant's years at the museum, but also the earlier history and the origin of the museum. And the archive also gives us a snapshot into William Valiant's personal thoughts and regrets with regard to his professional life. You know, he may have complained, but without him, we would not know everything I just told you about the museum. 30 years of his life were spent here making the museum into something that could be used by Rutgers faculty and students and the general public. I mean, could you imagine being a little kid in New Brunswick in the early 1900s and leaving school and running over to the geology museum to play? I mean, it, it's these details that Valiant tells us in his papers that make his story so interesting. And, you know, in, you know, in closing, one thing that can be said with certainty about William Valiant was that he was the person who transformed the museum into a practical and organized and useful place for many people for many years to come. So thank you very much. That's the end of my part. And I think now it's time for questions, right? Thank you so much to both of you. Um, so I will, we have a lot of questions, so I'll read them to you. Um, and I have the document here. So the first question is, what kind of stone is the museum made out of? And do you know where the building materials came from? Connecticut. Connecticut brownstone. So the, so the stone for Old Queens is from Nyack, I think. And yeah, and the, so, and Carol's got the answer for the, for the geology museum. So it's not, it doesn't exactly match Old Queens, but it's, it's close. Thank you. And um, the next question is, why was the president's house demolished? Well, the story that's always given is that it was uh, damaged in a hurricane and it, to such a great extent that it had to be demolished. But the Rutgers presidents moved around a lot. Um, there have been several different locations where Rutgers presidents lived. And it, it may have been that the, you know, uh, that house had outgrown its usefulness as a, as a president's house. Um, How old is the Kirkpatrick Chapel in relation to the museum? They were built at the same time, approximately, like within a year. And uh, is George Cook's house still standing? It is. It is still standing. But it's empty, which makes me very unhappy because whenever a historic building is empty, it invites horrible things. So um, uh, it's a very important building and it's right on George Street. Uh, 
um, you know, like, uh, across the street from where the Honors College is now. Yeah. It's a great location. There are about a thousand different purposes I can think of for that building. Not that anyone ever asks me, but it's a great building. It's a great little house. Was the geology building sited on the hill to maximize natural light? Well, that's an excellent question, but um, I don't think so because Old Queens was already there and Rutgers owned the land. So I think proximity to Old Queens and the fact that they already owned the land would have been more important than natural light. The next question is how slash why did Valley influence his arm? Oh, um, yeah, so he had an accident at a mill where he worked and the arm was drawn. And if you, if you, if you want the, I can go back to that article because it explains it in terrible You don't, you don't want to know. Imagine a big piece of equipment in a mill and then, then the arm is inside of that piece of equipment. That's yeah. Cool. And that was when he was 16 in 1861. I just can't believe that it says in the article, because Carol showed it to me a few days ago, that they took skin from his back to cover up the side. So it's amazing that he survived. Imagine how dangerous that surgery was. Yeah, especially for that time, that's amazing. Um, so the next question is, is the spiral staircase original? Yeah, yeah. And how much of what Valiant changed is still in place today from systems to building design? <laughs> That's definitely for Carol. Can you repeat the question? <laughs> how much of Valiant's you know, design systems organization is still there? That I don't know. Um, because maybe, maybe all those cases are gone, so. I'm not sure if they were sort of just replicated in the cases that are there now, or, you know, I don't know. I think I can speak a little bit to the way his philosophy of educating the public, I think that's his legacy still, right? Of yeah. making it open to the people and accessible to the people. And that very much is 100% is our mission <laughs> today. Uh, as far as his classification and all that, um, that, is not as in the forefront, but yes, his his science communication legacy very much lives on. So Lauren, you won't mind if like New Brunswick school kids come in in the afternoons and mess no. around and <laughs> you'll teach them. I mean, we've had some crazy things happen. Uh, we've had people try to ride the dinosaur uh, and climb the <laughs> mastodon. And so, yes, we 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 don't mind to a point right <laughs> yeah i thought that was a really a very sweet memory though i just made me smile when i read that so were the independently owned specimens collection uh were they bought or donated by their previous owners to valiant and how did he continue to expand the collection so this is a two-part question so they weren't they they weren't donated directly to Valiant. They were donated to the the Geology Museum. Um, and what was the uh, what was the second part? How did he continue to expand the collection? Well, so it's it was, it's really interesting. In a lot of the um, the 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 catalogs that were written for Rutgers College at the time, and also in the issues of Mineral Collector that I mentioned in my talk, he, Valiant is always saying like, send us anything, <laughs> send us all your stuff. And so I think people really did. And, you know, some of the collections were, you know, not useful or not, you know, they didn't want to really use them, but some of them were, were quite useful. And um, some of them were from people in the area, like um, Roebling, for example, was, uh, you know, donated a lot of the collections as well. So um, I think it was just, you know, partly advertisement and partly just, you know, people knowing people within the discipline. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's fairly typical of 19th century science museums, both in in the UK and in in the US. I probably true for other European countries as well. That the collections are a combination of donations and purchases, and 
you know, it's a kind of uh, a curator's job is to create relationships with people who, who collect things. Sometimes it's, you know, sometimes the collectors are really merchants and they are just, they're trying to sell stuff. Mm -hmm. um, there was, um, there was a natural history dealer, basically based in Rochester, New York, who sold entire collections. So he, he sold Smith College the whole science museum like it, you know it was like a package deal um in other cases curators would write to someone like ward that's the guy in rochester and say um you know we really have a great collection of make this up right we really have a great collection of birds but we have a terrible collection of amphibians and we just want a few representative whatevers you know what do you have so that's that's, it's really surprisingly haphazard the way 19th century science museums develop their collections. Well, and Lauren made a comment in the in the chat too, which is also correct that a lot of the don't a lot of the collections were either donated or bought after the death of some collectors. Like for example, the historic collections that I talked about, you know, Beck and uh, Chester and Cook those were either you know bought and then donated to the museum or or donated to the museum when they died was the shank observa observatory near the parking lot also constructed around the same time as the museum and was it made by the same builder uh no it's 1865 to 1866 so a little bit earlier it's not the same architect and I don't know about the builder. But I, I would place it more or less under the same umbrella of it's after the land grant and Rutgers is, is sort of recasting itself as a research university and research universities need observatories. But, but Shank donated the funds for the observatory out of the blue. Rutgers wasn't expecting the gift. And it isn't necessarily what Rutgers would have chosen to build in 1865, but that's that's how, you know, not that different from museum collections. The donor has the money and the donor wants to make a specific gift and that's what it was. Is a copy of Valiant's uh, pamphlet preserved in any Rutgers collection? Yes, that's actually where, and I, I, I wanted to put a, a picture of it, but it, it just was, it was small and it didn't really show up very well on the slide. So, um, but yes, it, there is a copy of it in uh, Special Collections and University Archives and his papers. And here's another question for Carol. How much Valiant's 1000 page manuscript did you read? <laughs> So that's a funny story because I don't know if many people know that um, special collections at Rutgers had some significant damage from Hurricane Ida in August. And so they have had to close and move all of their collections. So I basically got in there in this very short window of time when it was open you know, after Ida, but before they closed to move everything. And so I had, a very short window of time. So I basically scanned for my dear life and got and picked things that I thought were going to be important. And then, you know, my time, you know, my time was up and I couldn't, I couldn't go in anymore. So I, the short answer to your question is probably maybe a quarter of it. But it was pretty cool. <laughs> And the, the next question is, where are the details of that uh, future collections of 2020 trip you were talking about? <laughs> same, pla oh, same place, all the, yeah. It's, I was like, wouldn't that be a really cool trip? Car um, Lauren, come on. Um, I did scan, I did scan that chapter because that chapter was too interesting to leave behind. Um, but that is in special collections as well. I have a feeling there's probably something built on top of that site. <laughs> Been digging I don't know though. Things. There's one area that he references that I think is where the Wolfson parking deck got taken down, which is an empty field right now. So. Um, and so what is the history of the number of annual visitors to the museum? What time period had the highest attendance? 
And I can tell you that pre-pandemic, we did have 10,000 visitors per year, so. Um, wow. That, I, I don't know. Do you know that, Carla? I don't know the exact, well, the only reason Lauren, I knew. Lauren or Kathy might know. I only have the records from when we've been doing it for the last 10 or so years. And, and like Rhea said, yes, our right before the pandemic was our highest with tours and everything of a little okay. over 10,000 visitors. Yeah. So other than that, I don't have, we don't have the data for other times. So <laughs> I think I, I, there, it might, you might, I might be able to find out in archival, um, you know, in more valiance papers, but I only knew that one 3000 was because it was in that brochure. Well, it would be a standard thing to list in an annual report. So mm -hmm. We might be able to just look at every 10 years or something like that. Yeah. And I think this might be the last question. So for someone interested in history, are there other buildings on Rutgers campuses that they should know about? Well, sure, there are lots of them. Um, let's see. The historic core of the, of the Rutgers College campus, so the part in New Brunswick, has a lot of really important buildings. Uh, I mentioned the Cook House, which could use a little bit more research. Um, the building I'm currently most concerned about is Ford Hall, which was built in 1915 by the architect Bertram Goodhue, and Rutgers intends to demolish it, and they have stated on numerous occasions that they're going to demolish it. They have no idea what they're going to replace it with. Um, facilities has been very open with me in sharing their belief that they can't, they cannot save it, um, which means they can't, they don't want to pay the money that it would take to save it because it, it is in, it's not in great shape. It's a complicated building because even though it looks like it's a long skinny building that would have a corridor down the middle, it's not, it's more like five row houses. And there's staircases everywhere, and um, some of the floors were made of a uh, kind of unusual material for 1915. Um, but that's a really important and interesting building. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I think that that Carol and I and some others are working on um, raising the profile of the Geology Museum um, by applying for a national landmark program that would not change anything legally, but it would give it greater prominence. But, but the other thing that's also been in the works for a while is if you think about it, uh, if you know Rutgers, if you think about the Geology Museum, Van Nest Hall, Winans, uh, Old Queens, the chapel, and Schenck Observatory, that block, there's nothing in there that was built after 1890. Winance is the newest, and that makes a really amazing collection of 19th century buildings. It looks more like a 19th century college than a lot of other 19th century colleges because they have other things mixed in. So that is a very important historic district. And there's actually two more questions. Um, so the first question is, are any of Valiant's handwritten labels still in existence or still on display? They must be, don't you think? What do you think, Lauren? I mean, we have some of the historic labels on display. I'd have to look to see if they were written by Valiant. Maybe we can do a handwriting comparison, Carol, at some point. His handwriting is beautiful, luckily yeah. for Carol. Um, and I haven't gone through all of the collections that are in storage, but I'm sure they're there too. Um, yeah, people tend to be pretty sentimental about handwritten labels. I doubt they would have all been thrown out. No, and we, we make a point to keep them because it is, in a lot of cases, the labels are more important right. than some of the minerals, yeah. so. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't mean you. I, I mean, obviously you would never do that, but I'm thinking of like in the 1930s, 1940s, 1950s. I mean, even back then, yeah, there are some minerals with the objects. Yeah, that we have five labels for them, and it's like from all the years of them being relayed. Oh, neat! And stuff, that's so really cool. that's kind of cool. Yeah. Also, one other thing for the last question about historic buildings, I think Rutgers actually put out a publication um, for its 250th anniversary. It came um, 
on historic buildings on the campus. I, I just did a really quick search through my files to see if I could find it and I, and I couldn't, but I think if you just Google or search around a little bit, Rutgers did put, did put out a publication for the 250th anniversary on historic buildings on campus. Okay, yeah. I just wanted to add that we have some text on our website, I put it in the chat. Um, of that historic brochure. I think it might be the one that you're referring to, Carol. It is, it is, it's, it's actually verbatim. So if okay. you wanna read, it, it doesn't, it has the text, it doesn't show the actual- um, Right, exactly. Yeah. The actual um, pamphlet. Okay, now we have the last question. Um, is Valiant's prioritized trilobite with the legs from Beecher's bed currently exhibited somewhere? Um, so I am not sure I am working. I, I spoke to uh, the collections manager for invertebrates at Yale on Monday, and she sent me as much as she could in that short time. Um, but she's looking for me to see if we can find those. I, I have a, an inkling in one of the reports that Valiant wrote that those specimens were actually, it, it mentioned something about them being on loan to the Rutgers Geology Museum. And I wonder whether Valiant took them with him, which I think would be, you know, he found, if, if they were a gift from, you know, from Beecher to him, I think that it's perfectly, you know, feasible to think that he would have just taken them with him when he left. But we're not sure. We're, we're trying to find out is the short answer. But there are, but there are some of the specimens on at Yale right now. They are not um, on display because actually the Yale Peabody Museum is under a complete renovation right now, so they have, you know, nothing out right now. Um, but there are, there is a list of specimens that Valiant sent to Yale there, and um, yeah, so they are there. Hey, thank you so much. And that wraps up our day. So thank you so much to both of you. That was really interesting. I learned a lot. And thank you to everybody who presented today and to all of our audience members. And Dr. Scott, you can uh, go ahead. <laughs> Great, yes. Um, I'd like to thank you all for coming today. I wanted to remind you that our mineral sale is still going on on Facebook, so I hope you'll stop by and see what we have to offer. And I hope you will continue your support of the museum uh, by attending some of our other remote programs and coming in to visit the museum again when it opens next week. Um, we really appreciate your attendance here today and we thank you for your support. So thank you and goodbye. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>